So our, uh, our presenter this afternoon is a former member of the United States Coast Guard Band and is currently serving as the, uh, is the Associate Professor of Tube and Euphonium at the University of Pembroke and University of North Carolina at Pembroke. So please welcome Dr. Joanna Hersey. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so excited to share this information with you today. And while we have a little bit shy of an hour and it's only enough time to scratch the surface, I'm still really glad that you're here to hear it with me. So as Zach said, I'm a tube euphonium professor at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. But before that, I was and always will be a Coastie playing the tuba. And so our story today begins with me joining the Coast Guard Band as a young person. Now, our room today and our audience at home divides somewhat in half. There are some of us old enough to have served in the 90s, when the 50th anniversaries of World War II happened throughout the military, many of us are aware of these women veterans and have maybe been lucky enough to meet them and work with them, but some of us don't know this story. And when I was young and first starting out, I did not know this story. And so today we begin where I began, here. My collateral duty in the U.S. Coast Guard Band, in addition to lots of sousaphone and tuba playing, was I worked in the music library where I came across this photo. And this is the Coast Guard Spar Drum and Bugle Corps, a division of the United States Coast Guard Spar Band, an all-female band in World War II. And I had no idea at 20 that this existed. And I went and I said, what's going on? Who are these women? And so one of the things that I want to bring home with us today is how sometimes we tease the storytellers in our life. So all of us that are in groups, there's always a storyteller. Somebody in the group that as soon as a new person comes in, they're going to tell that same story for the 40th time. And we kind of roll our eyes a little bit. But every group has to have storytellers. And so I had this photo in my hand with nothing written on the back. And someone said, ask Ralph. Ralph will know, right? And Ralph did know. Ralph said, you got to talk to the Coast Guard lady. The Coast Guard lady was a spar herself. And the Coast Guard lady answered my letter immediately, because it's the 90s. So you wrote letters then. The Coast Guard lady said, yep, that storyteller, her name is Betty Frank. And Betty Frank said, yes, here are the names, instruments, maiden names, and married names, and mailing addresses of all the women who served in this bar band. So <laughs> the storytellers. So what I did from this photo was I started letter writing and pen palling with the women in the United States Coast Guard Spar Band. And I asked them a series of questions. What did they play? What was it like? And all of them wrote me back. One of them sent me her entire autobiography. Every one of them, they sent newspaper clippings and photos. And they were thrilled that somebody cared to know. Now, interestingly, about five or six years after that started, another woman, a clarinetist and a music educator and a college professor, kind of too random for our liking, these events, she was randomly sat next to at a luncheon for women band directors, the director of the Marine Corps version of this, the Marine Corps Women's Reserve Band. So Jill Sullivan sat next to, randomly, at a luncheon, the woman who directed the Marine Corps Women's Reserve Band, and she said what I said. What did you play? How was it? How did you find it? And she embarked on the same journey. And it's because of Jill that we have the information about the other bands. So Jill has written a book on this. It's here. You can see it in the background there. My Coast Guard women make up the Coast Guard chapter. And she did the research on the other services. And so you can see Jill took this ball and ran with it. As many of you might know that in addition to being a college professor, I am the president of an amazing organization called the International Women's Brass Conference. And that organization was founded in the 90s, an era when there's not the internet yet, where we can't easily find and network. And Susan Slaughter felt that women brass players, somewhat too isolated, needed a way to network. And one of her goals with the organization has always been to honor those who've gone before. So this photo is at the 2014 International Women's Brass Conference at Northern Kentucky University. And this is Jill Sullivan. We did a round table with some of the women that we'll talk about today about what their lives were like. So again, there's a whole book on it now. There's a handout in the back of some resources. So if you're wanting to do a little bit more research on your own, 
I've put together a bit of a handout and the information on these books is on it. Jill has also written a second book on general information about women's bands in the US, not World War II related specifically. I have a chapter in this on the women's bands in the vaudeville era, which is pretty awesome. There's a drum and bugle corps chapter, there's a chapter on the Jim Crow era and women's bands in the South, so she's gotten the scholarship going in a really beautiful way for us. And so we had all this information. This was my desk a little while ago. And our goal is to share it with you. It's being documented very well at this point. If you Google United States Coast Guard, Spar, Band, World War II, you're going to come up with all kinds of stuff. But that wasn't the case back in the day. So we got lots of cool things. This is Betty Frank. She sent it to me, the program from 1944, the graduation exercises from the training center. So we have a sense of what they played. One of the things that I want you to do is I want you to see the level of dedication. It's been a long time since 1944, and that the ladies saved it all. One of the things they saved is this little tiny photo. And I'm actually going to come down and hand it to you because I want to pass it around. I want you all to hold it and look at it. This tiny little photo she saved 76 years. It's of the bus driver them standing next to the bus driver. One of the themes of today is buses. So I'm going to come now. I want you to hold it and immerse yourself in that 76 years. So just like you were in my college, Carl, you're going to pass it around. And I'm going to ask you to hold it and immerse yourself in that 76 years. So because these women, for these women, this was one of the highlights of their life. And because of that, they saved everything. So side note, we're in a thing right now of decluttering. Right? We're supposed to, if it doesn't give us joy, but those of you that might be a little bit pack rats, hold on to it because we, we need to have the preservation, right? So it's okay if you're going to save your stuff. It's all good. So some of you might remember that in World War II, a big part of it was that finally women were able to serve throughout the services. Women, of course, have been serving in wartime for all, always, but now in an official capacity through all the services. And interestingly, it almost didn't pass. It was less than 10 votes in the Senate to, to bring about women in wartime. But you can see more than 370,000 women were enlisted. And so we've got, during this time, women coming in to take the jobs of men. And it's free a man for sea, or free a marine to fight, right? And we're going to pause for a second right here, because all of these photos are so joyful. I'm going to play you some recordings. It's such a positive thing to discover how they went out and did this job. We've been enjoying military music this week already. It still gives us joy and morale for the nation. But I want to pause us because when you free a Marine or you free a man for sea or you free a man to fight, they're going to go die. They're going to go down in the ship in the Pacific or they're going to be killed on the front. And so these women, the wonderful story I'm going to share with you, an important part of it is they were hated much of the time. And they don't talk about it, they're super positive and they're smiling and they did their job. But if you're gonna send 370,000 women into the military, that many men are potentially gonna go back out into the front. Women didn't serve in the front. So while they did all this wonderful work, they did it under duress. And if you pressed them, they would say, well, yeah, there was that one time we walked down the street and they spit at us or the time they stole all our hats, or when they didn't serve us in the restaurant. But that's not what they want to talk about. But I want us to remember that all of this is happening under a period of time where men are dying, and lists of the dead are in the paper. And these women were maybe causing that in people's minds. So they did it anyway, thank goodness. I love this one. This is our Coast Guard storyteller, Betty Frank. She didn't want to. <laughs> She played the trumpet, the cornet. She didn't want to. She wanted to go to radio school. Coast Guard had a lot of radio operators. And they had a captain's mass. They had a complaint hearing, and they were like, nope, sorry. Got to play the trumpet. What they, did with, like what they did with the men was they surveyed them when they came to boot camp. What special skills do you have? What can you do? If you could play the trumpet, you're supposed to write that down. And then they funneled the women who seemed to have a lot of experience into the band programs. And as you can see, sometimes you didn't have a choice. Poor Betty. She's the one that sent that little picture of the bus driver, so she's, she's okay now. Now we have 
a good amount of bands. There are, the Air Force comes into the story also a, just a little bit after wartime. So we have the women's bands and all the services, but we're gonna talk about that in stages. One of the most important things they did was march, as you might imagine, the concert sit-down bands and drum and bugle corps is actually a big part of it too, as you'll see. So the Air Force comes in a little bit later and this is across the services. So they came already having music education, a good amount of them. Half the Coast Guard Spar Band, for example, was in music school at, at the time of the war. So one of the things that was interesting is because of this backlash against women joining the service, one of the things that they did was they had them come in at 20 instead of 18. So as a young woman, you could not join until 20, which meant that they were slightly older and no longer teenagers. So if you were a middle or upper middle class white woman in, the, in this time, you probably were already in college. Women's colleges are flourishing. So these women had musical experience. There's one woman in the Marine Corps band with a master's from Juilliard in performance already. The conductors were highly trained. They came in already working out in the field as secretaries. So they're, they're very vastly experienced. It wasn't that they were taught to play an instrument when, when they came along. Here's our first bus. I love the bus photos. If you've been in a military band, you spend a lot of time doing exactly this, waiting by the bus. I love this photo too because those of us that take a lot of pictures, me. Some of the best ones are the more casual ones that is, um, isn't posed, so you'll see today we have some posts. This is the Marine Corps Women's Reserve Band. So we're gonna do a little bit of a quick who, what, when, where, why. The Army Corps was the biggest. 140,000 women come into the Women's Army Corps. They open up a lot of positions and they have five women's bands eventually. It's somewhat a moving target because there might have been one band and then they split off into two. But in general, we've got five. And the time period for the women's bands is mostly mid-1943 to the end of 1945. So about a two and a half year service. By 1946, the bands were deactivated and as the end of the war came, they were all discharged. One of the sadder parts of the story is that they don't get a choice to stay and continue to play. The women were signed on just for the duration of the war. So the WAC is by far the largest women's army corps. And you are a girl with a star spangled heart. So even though it's a bit of a moving target, this is some of the places that the Women's Army Corps bands were stationed. I know also that there were some in San Francisco by the end of the war welcoming the troop ships home in the Pacific. And Camp Rustin becomes one of our largest prisoner of war camps in the US, the largest I think. And when that started to happen, they moved the women out. So it is a bit of a moving target, but you can see that they're spread out. Some of the pictures of the camps for Oglethorpe, Georgia, Iowa. All bases look the same, so sometimes it's a bit of a guessing game where they are. Although you can usually tell North Carolina because of the palm trees, the pine trees. So the second to the Army is the Navy in size. 86,000 women joined the Navy in World War II. And one of the things that happened was the Army went first, as was their job being the largest, and they had, as we've said, this bit of a smear campaign, this backlash against these poor women. One of the things they did was they questioned their morals, their purity, as in that they would be promiscuous if they, no woman would join, no innocent woman would join the army unless she wanted to be around men all the time, and so they were attacking their character. So they really tried when the Navy went, after watching what happened with the army, they tried to calm it down a little by connecting it more to the college campus than the base. Because think of the Navy, I mean this, no offense to us fantastic Navy people, but it's a little bit of a rough and ready type of reputation. So the fact that they got 86,000 women into the Navy, and the Navy ran communications in DC, the women of the waves, women accepted for volunteer emergency service. So at one point in DC, there's almost 5,000 Navy women running communications, just in DC. It's amazing. So I did not know also that women were serving in those high numbers during World War I in the Navy, including women of color. We're gonna talk about that also. So they went for this wholesome collegiate image and they thought, who could we get to be in charge of all these waves? So they got the president of Wellesley. <laughs> so our, our kind of Ivy League with the seven sisters, the Ivy League schools, Smith, right? All of these colleges, Mount Holyoke, these are where they station the women. And so the president of Mount, of, of, uh, Mount Holyoke, they were using this wholesome collegiate image, which actually worked beautifully for them. 
So what we've got in this case is Navy women's bands at all of these training centers, at least briefly. They did move around too. Hunter College in New York is now Lehman College in New York City, and they had women of the Coast Guard, Marines, and Navy there, as many as 5,000 women. At, these are boot camps, as many as 5,000 women. They did a six-week boot camp, and then they did onto their A school, their training school. So the Navy bands, for women had a little bit of a different form. Bur bands were a permanent duty station in all the services except the Navy. Meaning that you did your six week boot camp, maybe you played in a band at boot camp, but then you went, the spar band was a permanent duty station. And in this case, the Navy kept it just as boot camp bands. So they only were together for the six week period when they would be at boot camp, and then they went off and did their communications. And so the bonds and the history it's, it's also taking place more on college campuses. So the Navy doesn't know as much about this, and Jill writes in her book that when she goes, they actually aren't sure there even was a band. So she's telling them, because the college campuses, like Georgia State College, their archives have it. So that's why we gotta keep our stuff. There you go, you can tell we're in the South Pine Trees. That's Georgia State College and the Navy Training Center. They had 5,000 women at any given time coming in and out, 240 women battalions, and many of the battalions had a drum and bugle corps. So there's a lot of drum and bugle corps action. There is one of the photos. I mean, if you're gonna go for it, go for it. And sometimes it's a little bit tricky with the uniforms. The, the women of the spar bands uniforms look similar to the Navy, but that's how come we're glad we have the bass drums. In DC, these four to 5,000 women that are serving the communications needs of DC, they had a concert band that was um, f more for fun, so not a permanent duty, but, but an extra duty, an additional duty, and they did play and march parades in DC. This is a photo up of the Great Lakes Naval Training Station. I'm not sure what's going on, but that's a dog there in the middle who's clearly in charge of all of us. So these are waves, not a wave band, but the Great Lakes Naval Training Station has a long history of band programs because Sousa was there. And Sousa worked with more than 1,500 musicians in World War I at the Great Lakes Naval Training Station. So this is an automatic place to put a band program, even if it is women. So that's exciting. The women of the Navy bands, even though they were only there during boot camp, they did actually go out and work selling war bonds. One of the biggest things that these bands did contribute in addition to their musical morale boost was the sale of war bonds. So we'll talk about that also. This is Waves marching at Smith College. And then the Marines, the free a Marine to fight, they looked at what had been happening before and they thought, well, we're gonna go a different way also. They had one band, they're easy, they had one band and it was stationed at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina for the entire time and so they're easy to keep track of. And they decided that they were gonna go super high-end pro, they were really gonna get the best band that they could find. So what they did was they came up here to the President's Own and they chose three musicians from the President's Own who were assigned, not, they couldn't volunteer, it was, they were told, <laughs> go down to Camp Lejeune for three or four months and start this band program. So the, the women of the Marine Band, the women's Marine Band were auditioned by the President's Own, and so these three men went down, formed the band program, got the instruments, got the music situated, and that band is, as you can see, at 43 pieces, a good sized band, they're active. We have three recordings. Now that these, these women, the youngest women that served in these bands, because you had to be 20, they're all turning 96 this year, and some of them are even older. So maybe we're not gonna have more artifacts come to light, but there's always a hope that there could be more recordings. But of the three recordings we have, two of them are of this band. So they were um, really working to stand out from the crowd. And again, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, just the one duty station. And there they are. Those are those longleaf pines, so you can tell North Carolina. This is a picture of, of a wave unit with the Marine Corps Women's Reserve Band behind, again, in North Carolina. They did travel, but they were based only at Camp Lejeune. Okay, so now we need to hear them, right? So this is one of the only recordings we have from what sort of the literature we're gonna talk about that they, they played exactly what you would have thought. They play what we play today, poet and peasant, 
Stars and Stripes Forever, Duke Ellington. They played exactly what we all still play, all of those old classics. So let's listen to a little bit of them. <laughs> So at 43 pieces, again, pretty strong. The average Women's Army Corps, also around that number. The Coast Guard Spar Band came in, a, but a little lighter of an instrumentation. So the Spars, my beloved Spars, release a man for sea. Again, the Coast Guard is joining in with the Navy. And the Coast Guard always being smaller and intensely proud of their military service. So by July 1943, the Coast Guard also has a women's band. It's at 35 pieces. We have a, one of the other recordings we have is of the Spar Band. So even though it's small, 11,000 women is a lot of women. And again, more than half working on music degrees at the start of the war. And in the 90s, when I wrote them a letter and said, oh, I'm Joanna, and I play the tuba, and would you? They all wrote back to me in droves, even though it's 60 years later at that point, about how wonderful it was. And as I said, intensely positive about the whole program, even though you know it must have been pretty rough. So they had actually a kind of a nice boot camp training center. They got to go to Palm Beach. So they were at the Biltmore Hotel. Many of us know that one of the things that happened in World War II is our fancy grand hotels. They wrapped up the chandeliers. They took the china down. And they put troops. And they became hospitals. They became training centers. So the Coast Guard spars all were sent to Palm Beach for training. So they all have palm trees in their photos. So that's easy to figure out. And they moved at one point. But they started out in Palm Beach. There's only ever one band in the Coast Guard for women. And, and the male bands in all of our services, like the Coast Guard band that I was in, these bands are going on also all this time. The women's bands are just in addition. So in the sense, it didn't necessarily free a man to fight in the band world because those other bands weren't closed down. But just in general, being a women's reservist was a little tricky. So here's the one Coast Guard band that moves. We start out in Palm Beach, and then the band was moved to Washington, D.C. about midway. And then they're here for the duration of the war. So we see that. Here's one of those palm tree shots. There they are, small and mighty. Now the publicity. So it's a bit of a smear campaign, as we said. Your morals and your... your um, your, your righteousness is questioned if you're going to join the military. But then again, the society, we're, we're really struggling because this is the whole Rosie the Riveter time. We're struggling. How do we feel about women being out in the public eye? Upper class, middle and upper class white women, this really hadn't been something that they had experienced before. Women of color have always been out working. Lower economic level women, immigrant women have always been out working. But especially for the educated middle and upper class white women, this was new and people weren't sure how they felt about this change. And you you can see that in their recruiting. They did a beautiful job because the women that they got were amazing. I love this poster. So if you think about what that looks like as, and who that woman is, she's strong and competent and capable. She's serious. And she's going to protect that lighthouse. And I think that's a really positive image. And so they, all of the services had recruiting posters of all kinds. They did for men also, of course. And then, but, but, but you're still not sure, so then you have this. Her face, you guys. So you can see what they're getting at. They're trying, I don't know, but so, <laughs> so we have this, right? She's fine. People just aren't sure they're not. We still don't know how to do this fully, right? We still struggle a little bit with this. So yes, but please enlist in the Coast Guard. OK. All right, so then this is me attempting to make a map. Again, it's a moving target. But what we've got is we've got the red. That's the Coast Guard that moved. 
The green is the Army WAC bands, the Navy is the Naval Training Stations, and brown is Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, with the Marine Corps Women's Reserve. So the point with this is, even though they were many different places, that's a lot of women's bands coverage. And they're touring that local area, they're playing parades in their local area, they're welcoming ships home and playing the work on the bases, so colors, dance work, more buses. Everyone sent me photos of the buses. I mean, you have a love-hate relationship with the bus. It does get you off base, but then again. So I wanted to show you also the Coast Guard carried a drum major because she had been a drum major before the war. And so they advertise comedy sketches and drum majors as part of the Coast Guard scene, which I think is pretty cool. And then also an important part of our story is what the situation was like regarding race. So by this point in the 1940s in World War II, the military services are fully segregated by race. And one of the interesting things is, it's true whether we're talking about gender or race, we think that it automatically gets better over time. But I actually learned that we are less segregated by race in the military in the 19th century. The Navy's not segregated, for example, by race in the 19th century. And become segregated in the 20th century, the backlash against what had happened after the Civil War, so we actually became more tightly divided by race than we were already. And by World War II, that, that sort of sense of a compromise, well, we'll have all of the races served, but we'll keep them separate, was really a difficult thing. Where I am in North Carolina, we're gonna talk a little bit about a Navy jazz band. And North Carolina becomes a hotbed of unrest because troops that were from the North and weren't used to the rigidity of the Jim Crow South came in and there were a lot of clashes. So it's unfortunate that we remained segregated even though we were segregated, there are some amazing stories like Olivia Hooker. So the services were slow to adopt women of color into the ranks. The Marines did not bring any in until 1949, for example. And the Coast Guard brought in about 5,000 people of color by the end of the war. The Army has uh, one of their five women's bands is an African-American female band, so we're going to talk about that next, so that's wonderful. And Olivia Hooker, she's not a musician. I wanted to mention her, though, because she was denied entrance into the Navy as a black woman, and she was friends with Alex Haley. Alex Haley, the author, was a Coast Guard vet, so all of us Coasties are super proud of Alex Haley serving in the Coast Guard in World War II. Alex Haley said, you need to join the Coast Guard. So she did, and she was one of the first five African-American women to wear the Coast Guard uniform. Then there were more after her. She only just passed away last year at the age of 103. She went on to get her doctorate and worked for many years as an activist and an educator, so she's a pretty awesome lady. She probably played an instrument back in the day, but they didn't need her for that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about two other units of color that are working within this segregated system that aren't band units, but I think it's important to mention. And one of them is the 6888th. This is an African-American women's army unit, not a, not a band, not a music unit. The WAC had one band that was African-American, that's the 404th. But this, this group of ladies is famous and special as another, like the WAC band, another group of women of color who are working in this, it's pretty rough time. So the 6888th has the distinction of being the only WAC unit to go overseas. They sent them to England, and the story was, they, they're the male battalion, so they're dealing with the male, an important job. They had had a bit of an issue, and so the ladies arrived in England, and they were taken to a warehouse that was floor-to-ceiling crates of mail, more than a year's worth of mail for the entire front. And they said, fix this. Get this, get this out the door. So the 6888th did it in three months working 24 seven. They cleared the entire warehouse and got it back out of there, but they have the distinction of being, representing the US and representing women in the army overseas. Again, photographers, candid shot, 6888. Somewhat dreary work, but important work. So that is a side note from our women's bands, but this is the culture in which we're in. Now, another side note, because I live and in, in work in North Carolina, I wanted to talk for just a minute about the Navy's male jazz bands. They had two African-American jazz bands, the B1 being the first one, and they were all from North Carolina. In fact, two of the people in that photo are from the town I live in, Laurenburg, North Carolina. They were called from North Carolina A&T, Historically Black University, has a smashing music program, and they were stationed, as with the women in the Navy, 
they requisition a space on college campuses because you've already got housing, you've already got places to feed and meet and train. So the B1 band was stationed at UNC Chapel Hill. That is not segregated by race in 1940. So UNC Chapel Hill housed these men. I came across them because they're playing ship launchings in Wilmington, North Carolina. Wilmington, North Carolina, massive shipbuilding. So the B1 band has had a great, it's on your handout also, a great book has been written. So there's wonderful history already. He, he goes through. The poignant thing is that I bought this used online for $13. And it's got signatures of the band members in the inside of it. And it's signed by the author to a grandchild of one of the men in that photo. Except for it's with me instead of them, which I think is sad. But I'm going to hold on to it. And if you'd like to look at it afterwards, you're welcome to. I'm going to get right out of here because we have to have Gail's wonderful group. But you, I would love to show you the material. So the B1 band, they were trendsetters. They were the first African-American musical ensemble in the Navy. And they did a really good job negotiating, as I said, that, that strong problem that North Carolina was having with race. They got sent, guess where? Pearl Harbor. They were sent to Pearl Harbor right before it was bombed. And they were there during the bombing. And they were all OK. And then they came back again. And there was also a Navy band, African-American male Navy band, at the Great Lakes Naval Training Station, also where our women's bands were. So then I want to tell you about the WAC Band 404th. Jill Sullivan, the author of our awesome books that are on your handout, she posted on Facebook today that she's going to be doing a, a project with the Smithsonian on this band. She has published in the Journal of Band Research on this. She and I did an article jointly in the Journal of Historic Music Education, so some of our scholarly journals publishing. She's got a whole chapter on this band in her book on the women's bands. So you can see that it follows the same format as the other bands. Des Moines, Iowa was a training center that had, for, that had formed and trained African-American officers in World War I. And so then it's segregated by race, and it is a major WAC training center. I want to point out the fundraising aspect. One series of events, like a couple days, they made $86,000 by selling war bonds. We're going to talk about that. So their director had degrees from Fisk and Oberlin. Remember, Oberlin gets props because Oberlin is one of our few centers that is accepting non-white applicants. So Oberlin, you could go. And so she had a degree from Oberlin. She actually gave up, this is the director, she gave up a, a position as a college professor to join the army. And think, like, it's, it's a little bit of a struggle for these white women, let alone the women of color. There is some success getting in Native American women. Where I am in North Carolina, the Lumbee tribe, some of the women were flying flight missions from the Lumbee tribe. Hispanic women were often able to serve the Asian American women. It was a little harder. There was such a bias against Asian Americans at the time. So women of color are working within a really small sphere. And she left being a professor to join. And we're glad that she did, because they made a big impact, even though they were stationed in Iowa for the duration of the war. <laughs> so they, all of their audiences are Iowans. So this was the commanding officer of the unit talking about how unusual it would be to see a woman, in, a black woman in uniform, any woman, but especially a black woman. And some of the photos. Mostly white audiences. They didn't remember playing too much for people of color because they played out in the community and it was Iowa. But they marched. So they all share in common this sense that this, this was a bonding experience that lasted a lifetime. And all of them did collateral duty. The Coast Guard Spar Band has the distinction of actually being the only band that was given the MU rating. So they were a musician's rating. Although they did two hours of collateral duty a day, only two. And some of the other bands, they did their full collateral duty and then did band on the off time. Hospital work is one of the major things that they remember because it was so tough. So these young men are coming home from the front. Many of them are missing limbs. And all over, and this is one of those fancy hotels, the Breakers, that was made into a hospital. The women, I wanted to read you one quote from Ginny Collins. She says, well, at first I didn't like them going to the hospitals. The first time I went, they were very unnerving because almost every young man that was in that place had lost limbs. They were sitting in wheelchairs and it was hard. But after a while, it got to the point where you didn't pay attention. You went back and it was kind of like being with a buddy and they'd talk to you when you weren't playing. Those concerts were kind of neat. 
these are young women still. It may not have had as much experience with the wounded. They did a lot of singing also, but it was required that you played an instrument. There were no vocal billets in the women's bands. Another group watching a concert. Bus. I love this photo because she's just all going to carry that bass like right up there. <laughs> the Marine, Marine Corps Women's Reserve Band. Bus. Action shot. I forgot my whatever. I love that. The Marines again. <laughs> this photo shows the spar band in their drum and bugle corps playing a concert for civilians in a sit-down manner, which must have been a little vibrant <laughs> for the people in the front row. That lady's all poised, so they must not have started yet, right? But. <laughs> so like I said, they played exactly what you would think. They played what we play today. And I love, like, they play them basses. They play a lot of the things that we would expect they do a lot of choral work. They do a lot of singing features, which they didn't like, and they even comment sometimes about how much they hated having to do the singing, like we all do still. And, but it's interesting because when you hear them and it's the women's voices, it's really cool. So two of the three recordings we have, they're actually singing on, which is interesting. So they did a lot of that. The Tars and Spars, the, there's a movie, the Spar Band worked with Sid Caesar, and they were all excited about that. That, so these big stars, right? And they did radio broadcasts. And if you think of the times, like what makes you famous today? YouTube hits, right? Do you judge yourself by YouTube hits? Please don't. There's more to life than that. But back in the day, what made you a star was you were on the radio. There's not a lot of records being made. We don't have any examples of them making records that we're aware of in the war era. So it's being on the radio. And so the Marine Corps Women's Reserve, they took the place of the president's own on a radio broadcast. Instead of the president's own, here today, Marine Corps Women's Reserve Band. And they all wanted Jill to know that. We took the place. <laughs> they replaced the president's own there for an hour. And the Coast Guard Spars also had a radio broadcast. This is the one where we have the drum major and the comedy sketch. So it's very vaudevillian, right? But that works. That's why vaudeville was a hit. The success. People are down. It's World War II. I wanted to play you just a smidge. This is the Coast Guard Spars. Martha Reddick. I wanted to do a little bit of a smidge of the radio broadcast. You can hear them being referred to as girls. They could be 50 years old. They're still girls. Now, how about the band getting into the front? All right, let's see if we can corner you girls and play it soon. Lieutenant Reddick, how about leading the girls as they play and sing Illinois Loyalty? super proud these spars by Coast Guard ladies like they couldn't get off that ship until we were done. <laughs> the, the sailors were a little upset by that but the spars were really proud. Now we get to listen to another one, the Marine Corps Women's Reserve Band. <laughs> Thank you. 
for one, super glad we have that. <laughs> as much as they must have been like, that's the one, 80 years later, that's the one you have, right? <laughs> Little red caboose. But we all feel that, us military musicians, right? So we talked about before that one of the main duties that they had was to fundraise. Now some of you younger folks, they used to have these things called savings bonds. And it was a piece of paper that the government printed that you bought for $18.75. And then you kept for 10 years. So you gave your money to the government for this little piece of paper. And then you kept it and in 10 years it was worth 25. So you got a little bit of a rise on your investment. $18.75 during wartime is something along the lines of $260 in today's money. So it's not a small investment. And so what happened was the women did concerts. I wanted to show you this. The Coast Guard Spar Band, and she sent this to me. Full page ad in the paper. Open wide your door and pocketbook. So I want you to hold this in your hand. And there's like really cool ads for, you know, white picket fences on the back. So they were sent out to fundraise. And they would, like the women, the Coast Guard Women's Band had concerts where to get in you had to do, to buy the war bond. So it's a, it's a significant investment. They also had those things we do today where you put the quarters in the slots and when it gets to $18.75 you took it to the post office and, and they gave you the money. So again, they have bus, they have a war bonds bus. This is the Marine Corps Women's Reserve marching in Pittsburgh at an event that was to raise money. They raised a ton of money, they did a really good job. My favorite part of this quote is, she says, our lines of course were absolutely perfect. <laughs> and that they'd march a parade and then play a concert, so they were working hard. I love that. They all had collateral duties, even if it was in a small way, as we've said, even in the Coast Guard Band. So this is Betty Frank, the lady who sent me the name, address, and instrument of every one of those ladies in the Coast Guard. She drove, this is, she's of course not at the front driving ambulances, but she's driving ambulances within the area in DC that she might be in or within the area of Palm Beach. They talked about having to do guard duty at the base and being scared during the blackout when you're not allowed to turn on the outside lights and things, and having to go around with flashlights during guard duty. and. <laughs> A little bit scary. So they all did some kind of other work also. It just depended a little bit by service how much. At the end of the war, it was a little bit poignant as we've said because we've got these beautiful, amazing, historic military music programs and they're not allowed to go in. They were just there and Jill speaks about how she feels it's so much just for the fundraising. It was much more than that to the women. But as soon as the need was over, they were not allowed to stay, and it was the early 1970s before they're going to be able to come back in again. I know it's a long quote, but it really shows they're sort of too busy to think about it. And then it was hard. They were very good. Some of them were just as good as the rest of their colleagues in the male, in the male service bands. They did almost nothing with the male service bands. The Coast Guard Band, to my knowledge, did not ever play with the Coast Guard Spar Band. There are a couple of bands we're going to talk about quick here before we finish that were bridging the gap between 1945 and 6. They were over by 1946 and the 1970s when women could audition again. The first female member of the modern United States Coast Guard Band, the all-male one, did not come in until the early 70s. So one of those that bridged the gap was the Air Force. The Air Force waited and got a little bit of a late start, but then they blossomed. And so there was not an Air Force band until they were formed between 1949 and 1951. This picture is one of the very early photos, and so there were only 20 something, but they were up at a height of 50. And they, they were very, very, very fine. And they were only good until 1961, at which point they were deactivated again. And luckily for us, we have reunions. And so these ladies, like any other military units, they still today, the ones that are living, have reunions. And so people like me can go and meet them. And the Women's Air Force Band has been in the news recently this fall, many of us here in DC know, because they had a poignant uh, uh, final concert. And that's Jan Duga, Jan is over here. Jan is an expert on these because she is 
played alongside these, these women veterans. So a uh, side by side with women, members of the modern Air Force Band and these older women from the Women's Air Force Band in the, in the 1950s and 60s. So they decided that this was going to be the last time they played a concert as part of their reunion. They have banquets and time to, to be together and then also normally would play a concert. So that was what that photo was from just this past September. And I love that one of the parts of this that I think is the best is where she says, the standards of effort and excellence. So when I was in the Coast Guard in the 90s, I also had a side-by-side -side with the Spar Band. Luckily, by then, I knew who they were. And I wanted to show you Wilma. She, her nickname was Shorty. She wasn't very tall. Wilma Shorty Anderson came back to play with me in the tuba section in the 90s during the 50th anniversary celebrations of World War II. And these bands are having reunions. And in the next reunion pamphlet newsletter, she put her photo in with this caption. And her face, you guys. So that's me, but I don't know what I'm saying to the poor woman. <laughs> so she, she was very special and super sweet, and she played the whole concert with me on that sousaphone. And I wanted to read you just a little snippet. When she passed away, her husband wrote me a letter. He said, we were married 53 years, and they were wonderful, happy years. And it is very hard to imagine life without her, as I have loved her with all my heart. I was in the Navy in World War II and was always so proud of the surface record. So she died before her husband. And again, these women are, are all slowly leaving us. A second band that we need to talk about here at the end, also slightly after the wartime, the Army decided, for whatever reason, that they were going to bring one women's band back between 1949, about 1949, and that is what we call the 14th Army Band WAC. And they served with pride and distinction until 1976 when they put the first man in. <laughs> and it became not the 14th Army Band Whack anymore. So some of those ladies are watching. So hi, you guys. So they have a Facebook group. They have reunions every two years. They, being Korea and Vietnam era veterans, are a little bit younger. So they still have concerts. And as president of the Women's Brass Conference, I went to their reunion four years ago and gave them the award about being pioneers in the field. And they said, where's your tuba? And I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I said, you come again in two years and bring your tuba. So you can see on my YouTube channel, there's a video of we did them basses with three sousaphones out front of the band. It was awesome. I was really nervous. So they have Fort Anniston, Alabama is not a full base anymore, but they still have National Guard duties there. And that they have a chapel formed in honor of the WAX. It's got a, a small little museum exhibit space in the back. The WAC band, four tubas. This is from the re reunion. So now I, they've adopted the Coastie. So now I go every two years and I play. So this is them and two years ago. And you can see Sylvia there with her walker, World War II whack. She is still hale and hearty. And the, it's kind of a funny story. When they brought in the man in 1976 that made it not an all-women's band anymore, they're finally co you know, st st taking down the gender divisions and where finally our band programs are going to be um, both genders now. And Bob Delano was the first man that came in. He was still officially a WAC, a Women's Army Corps. And so while they were fixing all of how the titles went, so it's always ladies and Bob. So you got to love Bob lives in North Carolina. He's a sex fool. This is Sylvia, and you saw her in that other photo. If you can see her shirt then and now is what it says. So she joined in New Jersey in World War II. She played the euphonium. And she welcomed the troop ships home. They would send them out on a boat to meet them and play them back in the harbor. So they were two and three hour playing gigs because you had to go all the way out on the boat and then come all the way back. Just by chance, while I was getting ready for you all today, the director, one of the directors from 19, she directed the WAC 14th from 1949 to the early 70s, I think. And she only just passed away a couple of weeks ago, Ramona Mounts. And on the Facebook page, again, they're sharing and commenting, and they had people playing the music of the WAX for her in the hospice before she passed away. So in, in memory of all of them as we lose them. In 1974, the WAC band in Fort McClellan made a record, and I have a little of it for you. You guys, I bought a record player. I won the record at the silent auction. They let me have it, because they knew I was all excited to have a record. This 
is called Our Song. When I put that on their Facebook, they all said, oh my gosh, it takes me back to marching. <laughs> so we're closing in now on the end. I have one more thing to show you. This woman in the African American Women's Band, the 404th, everybody looked after each other. That was true of every unit in the war, male or female. There was one gig where almost all the bands were in one place toward the end of the war. This is the Wave Band, a Wave Band down in front of Wave Troops and then the Coast Guard Spar Band. Admiral Nimitz was a big deal, general, or admiral in charge of the Pacific Fleet. It was he that negotiated the surrender on the USS Missouri. So what happened was they had a big parade in his honor in DC, and on the, wash, on the mall near the monument, they erected a, you'll see it, a, a sort of a mock-up of the ship, and the platform party was there, and he got a big medal from the president. And all these women's bands played. The Coast Guard Band, you'll see the Coast Guard Women's Reserve. So this is where, this is my last thing. We do have one video from World War II, but it doesn't have sound. So as you watch, it's two and a half minutes. As you watch it, it almost makes it more poignant. So this is the parade. We see women's reserve from the Marines, the Marine Band, and Navy Drum and Bugle Corps, and then a little tiny far away shot of the Coast Guard Spar Band. the Marines. So that's the platform party and the mock-up of the ship where the surrender was negotiated. And you'll see all the waves, so many waves, almost 5,000 waves. There's still Marines. And these are the ways Drum and Bugle Corps. They were the ones doing it on their own time, so they would have been called from their collateral duty to rehearse and practice. And this is the only video that we know of. and then all the waves coming behind. Again, the WAC 404th, African American Band. So we need to make room for everyone in our stories. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>